Welcome to Pacific Mammal Researchers Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac-Man Podcast. I'm Cindy. And I'm Kat. And um, this week, uh, we once again um, messed up with you, listeners. Uh, we asked you <laughs> to choose, uh, and you chose the ring seal in a landslide. Um, however, I was do- I started doing the research, and I was like, this looks really familiar. <laughs> and I went back, and like we had done it last year. So we forgot to update our list where we decide what we've did- what we done and, and you know, check it off. Um, so sorry about that. The best, the best thing though is that that means that you can, in fact, go back and listen to the ring seal. So mm-hmm. if you are interested in learning about the ring seal, go listen to our former episode on that. Yeah, it's perfect. Uh, win win. And now the Ross seal gets to be done because we were like, well, we'll just do the Ross seal instead because some people did vote for that one. So <laughs> it wasn't a shutout. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, uh, so we're going to do the Ross seal today, uh, and we will make sure that our our thing is is up to date and hopefully i did go through i did go through an update and make sure there were actually there were a couple other ones in there so i'm like all right this was a good learning experience for all of us now everything in there is ones that are fully up for for voting so perfect thank you for doing that um yeah i think we just (laughs) forget to do that one little check mark after we do our research like go check that off on the list (laughs) so we'll be better at that in the future Um, So for now, we're going to do the Ross seal, um, which is another really cool seal. Um, And so I will let, um, they are, okay, they're weird looking personally to me. Um, I think they're beautiful. They're beautiful, but their heads, I mean, and you're going to talk about it, but. I mean, yeah, we'll get there. We'll get there. And I think we talked about these tangentially when we were talking about like the crab reader seal or other Antarctic seals or the Waddell yes. seal I think we did we did because we we're like this one's weird but this one's even more weird but um so I will let you discuss what they look like and kind of where they are to start us off yeah so the Ross seal is the seal that we are talking about today and these guys are basically entirely confined to Antarctic pack ice so they have what's called a circumpolar distribution so they technically can be found anywhere within the the southern polar regions. Um, They are found exclusively in that southern ocean and specifically in um, areas with that pack pack ice, so sea ice. Um, They mostly prefer inland areas, I did find. Mm -hmm. Um, And just to put that out there now, there are some vagrants that have been reported from um, some of the sub-Antarctic islands. So that includes the, these are some fun names, the South Sandwich Islands, the Southern Orkneys, Mm -hmm. the Southern Orkneys and Falkland Islands, the Scott, Kerguelen, and Heard Islands, as well as in Southern Australia. So some of these guys can range pretty far. Um, I know, Cindy, you're going to talk a little bit more about their behavior and why they might be more prone to vagrancy um just compared to some other seals Mm -hmm. but basically these guys are pretty much in in antarctica um they are this i'm gonna do the name now because it makes sense in terms of where they live um can i bump in just just wait just to remind people who say we were talking about pack ice i always yeah thank you recheck my brain on that so the pack ice is the stuff that's not fast ice which is land fast is is connected to the to the land so pack ice is just all the kind of big floating bergy bits and <laughs> mm. and and stuff that are larger pieces of ice that are um, not stuck to land, but bigger you can do things on. Yes, thank you for that, because that is always helpful to remember what we're talking about in terms of context for these guys. Yeah. So the Ross seal was first described by the Ross expedition in 1841. This was um, Commander James Ross, who was a British explorer who entered the Ross Sea, also named after him, um, yeah. during a period of exploration from 1839 to 1843. So that's kind of neat, but that's where they get their name from. And again, this is all kind of in and around that Antarctic area. So they are, again, you might imagine because of where they live, they are a fairly uh, understudied species. Um, 
I saw in pretty much all of the references that I looked up, they are basically the least well known of any of the Antarctic pinnipeds. Yeah, um, the rarest and the least studied and all the things. Mm -hmm. And again, like some of that does have to do with their behavior, which we'll get into in a little bit. But um, it would you'd be pretty lucky, I think, if you happen to see one of these guys and if you happen to be in Antarctica in general, because that would be pretty amazing. Um, <laughs> so in terms of what they look like, since we've already teased you, they are true seals. So that means that they don't have external ear flaps. They just have little holes um, and that when they're on land, they have to basically just like scooch along on or on the ice. Um, they can't rotate their hips underneath. So they do just kind of have to scooch along like a little worm. Mm -hmm. um, they are one of the smallest uh, seal species. So they grow from about six and a half to seven and a half feet. The females are larger than males. And the weight range is pretty variable. They weigh from about 280 to 470 pounds. So a pretty big, Funky. yeah, big weight range, which is interesting. Um, again, some of that does have to do with, with size differences as well. But um, yeah, pretty big range in terms of weight. In terms of what they look like coloration wise, I think they're really pretty. So they have a dark kind of grayish brown color on top and then have like a silvery colored belly. And they have these streak markings on their necks and throat, which are dark. So they have these like really cool, almost like paint strokes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really interesting um, paint strokes on their kind of neck and throat, which um, quite a few of the sources said resembles a mask at times. So it can go up and onto the face as well, potentially. It um, almost looks like they were a painting and it started to drip or they're like melting and it just like drips down their neck. I hadn't thought about that, but sure, it does. <laughs> That's yeah. what I did. <laughs> um, <I'm> like, <laughs> right. If you're watching this on YouTube, you will have a picture in yeah. front of you. But if you are not, I highly recommend going to check these guys out and Google images because they're really, really unusual looking. Mm -hmm. um, they don't have any rings like a lot of other seals do in terms of their markings. They really just have this kind of overall grayish color and then those darker streaks. They have fairly small little narrow bodies. Um, and as Cindy mentioned, they do look pretty different to a lot of seal species. They have broad heads, big eyes, and tiny little mouths. So it's kind of weird. Like stubby snouts. Like they don't have, a, it almost looks like they don't have, it looks like somebody cut off their, their face. <laughs> like short. Which if you like. If you think about in terms of where they live makes so much sense because anything that pokes out has a higher likelihood of freezing. Mm. So you kind of, if you're living in these really, really cold areas, you kind of want everything to be very compact and not have any like long limbs that are like, you know, separate from anything else. Mm -hmm. So it kind of makes sense. Um, and their, their big eyes, I will get back to in just a second, but they have the shortest fur of any seal species. Uh, yeah, it doesn't even look, look there like you go. now. Yeah, and it doesn't even look like there's fur. It just looks like it's like yeah. <laughs> there's nothing there. Just I know. And that was kind of like, wait, what? Because they live in Antarctica. You'd think they'd have more fur, but no, they just have a lot of blubber. Well, um so yeah, yeah, and they're so compact. So they're just yeah, they're just mm -hmm. they're putting all their eggs in the basket of blubber. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So coming back to those big eyes. And like Cindy said, they, I mean, I guess they are a little disproportionate because they have these little short squat heads and a tiny mouth and then these huge eyeballs. Um, yeah. And their body, like their head, their head looks disproportionate. Like yeah, <laughs> that's true. Um, but their eyes are specifically well adapted for seeing in those low light conditions. So they actually, their eyes are up to seven centimeters in diameter, which is about, let's see, like about two and a half inches ish, mm -hmm. I would guess. Um, that's really big. That's really big for like a six to seven foot animal. Um, and they have very wide pupils, which allows them to see well in that uh, that dark underwater realm, kind of underneath the sea ice. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a very good adaption for, or adaptation, excuse me, for hunting in that area, but it is a little weird looking, not gonna lie. Yeah. And, and then they have tiny little needle-like teeth was the last thing I had for for cool. catching those um this the, the what they catch which i will leave for cindy to share with us <laughs> yeah, to extent, like little vampire teeth. Mm -hmm. um i will say so, yeah. also, you, you may have be going to have it but i don't know if you have special names afterward but one of their names is big eye seal so I can't mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah i actually the I, I spent a little more time looking at the latin name because that's also um mm. should we should we just talk about that now because that actually relates to the eyes sure why well. not? okay so these guys are the only species of their genus. So the genus is Omatophosa, 
which is from the Latin omato, meaning eye, mm -hmm. and fossa, meaning seal. And their Latin name is omatofossa rossii, which, you know, the Ross's Ross seal. Eyed seal. All right. Yeah. Ross's big eyed seal. So it's pretty cool. <laughs> That's a, the only uh, the other one I saw was a singing seal, which makes sense because they're gonna they have a lot of different vocalizations. They do, they do. Uh -huh. So yeah, mm -hmm. that is what they look like and where they live. They're I think they're really cool looking personally. So they are cool looking. They just it just looks like it, okay. So it looks like a Persian cat. That's what they look like. Oh yeah, you know I could totally see that. Yeah, I'm looking at a face okay. on one and I'm like, okay, it looks like somebody just smashed their face into a wall and then squished it. And I'm like, oh, it's like a Persian, a Persian cat. <laughs> or I could totally see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we're going to go with the dog, since the seals are, you know, more closely related to dogs than cats. <laughs> so it's the pug of the seals. I like it. That's what I'm going to go with. There you go. <laughs> but they are very cute. I think they, they're just, it's just a little bit, when you look at them first, you're like, wait, something's wrong. <laughs> mm hmm um, but those, okay, so going on then to their diet and behavior, um, they do have those big eyes, um, the better to eat you with, right? Like the, um, uh, the, for the big, what bad is wolf. that from the, the big bad wolf? Oh, big bad wolf. There we yeah. go. I was like, wait a minute. Good reference, but what, yeah. wait, <laughs> <laughs> but wait, that sounds weird. No, it's from the story. I swear. Um, but yes, the big bad wolf will, you know, that's about, she goes, Oh, what big eyes you have? Little red riding hood says, What big eyes you have? And little, uh, the wolf says, Is that better to eat you with? Um, so hopefully, but they're going to be eating other things like squid, fish, and krill, and other zooplankton. Um, they are mainly a squid special, uh, specialized in eating squid. Um, and so a couple different studies from 1977, 1984, and then 2009. Um, so the first one is 1977-1984, said 64% were cephalopods, 22% were fish, and 14% were other invertebrates. And then this mm -hmm. 2009 study showed similar things, 47% squid, 34% fish, and 19% inverts. Um, and it's one, one of the references I have said that the lack of this prey in the Antarctic pack ice uh, for much of the year may have resulted in the, the Ross seals species scarcity there. So if they're specializing mm -hmm. in eating cephalopods and they're not there as much then their seals aren't going to be there as much makes sense and so that would imply that they were there at one time though well and if you look at so 1977 and if you take these numbers the percentages that i just gave as like what the first you know the the availability of prey it did go from 64 percent cephalopods to 47 percent squid from 1980s uh, to 2009 so perhaps there okay is yeah decline. yeah possibly interesting Hmm. Um, but the specialized diet uh, reduces competition with the other Antarctic seals or whales that are there. Smart. So, yeah. Um, they are considered uh, ice dependent, but they spend most of their time foraging in, op in the open sea away from the ice edge. And I'll get into um, why uh, in a minute. Um, actually, right now. Just kidding. <laughs> right, right look at that. You don't have to wait at all. You don't have to wait. I'm going to tell you right now. Um, they spend, um, because they, they stay away from the strong currents that can develop at the ice edge. Oh, interesting. Right. So Cause they are pretty small. So mm -hmm. that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. And if they're, they're kind of big and bulky, so they're not really agile in terms of like, you know, yeah, they're stocky. Because, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Um, and so one paper, I loved it, called them the commute, called them commuters. Oh, you know, that's you know, interesting. Like commute out to go get their food out in open water. Yeah. Staying closer. Yeah. So they're little Love it. Um, huggy commuters. <laughs> um, so, but they, as you noted, they can travel far. There's some tagging studies have tracked them as far north as the Falkland or uh, islands in Southern Australia. So there are these meanderers that are shifting out. Um, and who knows if that's a normal thing or a climate change thing? We don't know because mm. we don't know much about these animals. <laughs> Because they live in the yeah. end. Spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they um, so they can feed at a few hundred meters. And I have, where do I have their, how far they can dive? Um, oh, you know what? I might have been in the new research. Um, I'll get to that then a little bit. But it's a couple hundred meters. And so that's fairly deep. Um, and so they, they hypothesize that the large eyes may aid in the underwater vision. At those darker yeah. depths um, down there, which makes total sense. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically what I have. I mean, again, we have very, <clears throat> um, 
uh, not super in-depth <laughs> knowledge about most of the, the parts of their, um, you know, their diet and behavior and the things we're going to talk about just because <clears throat> they are, what do I have up here? It was the smallest and rarest of the Antarctic seals and the least studied. So mm -hmm. we, we know some cursory information. Um, their behavior, we know even less about um, because they're hard to find and then hard to um, study. But they do, they're usually solitary. Uh, and this one, they said uh, only three to 9% were seen in pairs. However, hmm. and, and that's what you, almost all of them say it's solitary animals. Um, but they may be more social than they appear because lone seals on the ice are often associated with diving seals beneath the surface of the ice. And that was in a study in 1990 interesting so, yeah um i mean you know harbor seals are also not supposed to be social or, or aggregate in open water but we found that they do here in the sailor sea so i think there's mm. a lot of things we don't know about seals because of the way we study them and they usually are studied when they're hauled out on land and we don't know much about yeah them. and you forget that like a lot of their lifetime is lived beneath the water so exactly. who knows what they're doing under there yeah interesting yeah, exactly and they spend uh i think it's most of their time at sea i think it was something like nine months or something um actually okay. i do have that in the, in the new research there was surprisingly a large amount of new research <laughs> oh that's cool yeah i wasn't expecting it. um okay so but they they we do know they do not congregate in large breeding colonies uh, and that's pretty common with these with the, the ice seals and they prefer larger and more concentrated ice located further in from the pack ice edge um, than that preferred by the leopard and crab eater seals, which are the other and um, other seals along with the Waddell seals that uh, are living down there. So that's what mm -hmm. you were saying. They like the inner parts better when they're on land. Yeah, yeah they like to be mm -hmm. hiding out. Um, they may establish territories underwater through vocalizations, mm -hmm. um, which that was interesting. And that's similar to other seals that vocalize underwater rather than on land like harbor seals do mm -hmm. um so that could be uh quite interesting uh, but, but we don't know too much about that um and what was interesting too is they they have they noted a couple times that they are um they have little fear of humans and that links to what you're going to talk about probably with predators where they may have less of them than others so it makes sense mm -hmm. that they might not be fearful of, of humans um which can be good and bad yeah, there aren't too many humans hanging around in Antarctica. So, exactly. so like, in oh, that sense, so they probably thing. are like, oh, you're a weird looking critter. What are you? But like, don't haven't had that experience in the past to know to be afraid of humans. Yeah, we're like the Sasquatches for them. Like, ooh. <laughs> <I need that. laughs> um, and then they will uh, molt um, after, their, after their breeding time. So let me get into their breeding. Um, they breed and molt in areas of medium to dense pack ice south of the 60 degree latitude. So they like to be cold, mm -hmm. um, live around 15 to 20 years, which is fairly normal for pinnipeds. Um, they're believed to reach sexual maturity at two to four for females and three or four for males. Again, which makes sense if you're living a shorter amount of time, you have to start having babies earlier in life. Um, mm -hmm. Pups are born in October or November. So remember we're in the Southern hemisphere. So that's the summer <laughs> mm -hmm. coming into austral spring and summer yeah exactly um and so they have a gestation of nine months um so they and um so they the females breed in december um it's not a, they haven't observed it but they believe it to be in water like other antarctic seals and again mm -hmm. if you're not congregating in big haul outs like some of the other seals and sea lions then it's likely that you're having your breeding in water um, and like other seals, they have an implantation that's likely delayed for a few months. So then the gestation is nine months. The pups are born in that October, November window. Um, and then they're nursed from around two to six weeks. So again, in the colder areas, it's usually a shorter um, fattening up time for the, for the pups mm -hmm. uh, there. Uh, and then they molt uh, in December, January. So after they have given birth, a female's given birth, and then they mate again, and then they molt. And then they go out to sea for the rest of the year that feels like a lot of energy expenditure at one time i know right yeah, it's i mean where it's like okay everything gets crammed into their summertime like yeah. wow but then you know you're spending it's like the opposite of uh being a teacher <laughs> everything's <laughs> crammed into summer and then you have nine months to just go hang out in the ocean and not get eaten by something else <laughs> that's you know that's fair that's yeah. fair it's a different uh, inversion 
Um, but that's and so they're mainly um, the uh, uh, they let mainly just hang out in the water for most of the year and then come out and do all their stuff. Uh, but that's pretty all we know. Probably solitary. Um, but we don't know much more than that. Hmm. And that's are. again where again, as Cindy was saying, because of that solitary nature, they it's it's possible that there are more individuals who would tend toward that kind of vagrant behavior, right? Where it's like if they're just kind of out by themselves anyway, it's like, oh, let me explore over here. Or let me explore over here. So right. um, that kind of makes sense since they don't rely on these large congregations like some other seal species do. They might be able to wander farther afield. Yeah. They'd be like, oh, I'm just going to check out that area or not. Yeah. Depending on the individual. Explore. Yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. they're cool. more like harbor seals where there's individual, a large amount of individual variation. Yeah, true. Who knows? Um, okay, well, that is what we have for their um, geographic distribution, what they look like, their diet and behavior. So we will take a quick break and be back with the threats and um, population status and some of the new research that we uh, were able to find. So we will be right back. All right, we're back. So Kat's gonna, um, actually, I think there's, I, th I don't think your section is gonna be as depressing as it is for other, for other no, animals. No, I like guys. it. Yeah. I like it a lot. Okay, so let's talk about it. So um, according to the Society of Marine Mammalogy, the total population of raw seals is estimated at about 130,000, which seems pretty solid, right? Given that they only live in this one little small area, it's like, all right, that's a pretty healthy population. However, there is a massive amount of uncertainty to that number. Plus or minus 130,000? Pretty <laughs> much. I mean, it's, it's uh, yeah, I think it was like, you know, the, the lowest confidence interval was like 20,000 and the highest was like 280,000. So like, yeah. there's a lot of variation that they, again, because of where they live, we simply don't know. Yeah. The most recent count that they did in Antarctica was 78,000 individuals. Mm. So that's not too far off, right? That that 130,000 mark. So again, that's that's kind of, I, I think the 130 number is, is kind of assuming, you know, X number of animals that weren't visible at the time, et cetera. Okay. Um, so it's kind of interesting because they are, they are listed as a species of least concern. They are thought to have fairly healthy population or populations down there. Um, which I just find really fascinating given that we don't really know a lot about them mm -hmm. that basically we're like, no, they're fine. Like, yeah. oh, okay. Yeah. They shouldn't so, be least concerned when we don't have the information that we need to know that they're least concerned. Right. <laughs> I think that's kind of what I thought was interesting. So again, yeah. and that might've been, you know, me missing some things, but I mean, from what I could tell, pretty much everything is like, there's no sign of decline. There's no sign of massive drastic loss from those who are studying them. Mm -hmm. So they think it's a fairly stable population. And it's again, probably conservatively, probably around about that 100,000 individual mark. Um, as I said, they are listed as a species of least concern. Um, and all Antarctic seals, including the Ross seal, as well as the crab eater, leopard, Waddell, uh, Waddell seals, and the southern elephant seals and Antarctic fur seals, are protected by the Convention for Conservation of Antarctic Seals. So that, that is a specific act that is um, in, in place to protect those specific species, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So basically we think they're doing okay. And <laughs> as Cindy said, some of that might be due to the fact that, again, from what we know, they don't have a ton of threats, which is again, nice to not have a really extensive threat section. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> The largest one, as you might imagine, is climate change. So, of course, because they are dependent on that pack ice and that sea ice, um, it does make them at much higher risk of population shift and decline from climate change. So this could have significant negative implications for their reproduction, um, as well as for their foraging success. And again, just increasing sea temperatures in general are going to also then shift their prey and where, what prey they're able to access and all of those things have a knock-on impact on the life history and health of those animals. And so a paper on looking at that and what, 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 what the warming motion might do to these guys. So that'll be a good. Oh, interesting. Good. Okay. Yeah. I was hoping there would be some new research on that. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll put a pin in that one for right now. Um, and the, the, I mean, the other main threat really is predation. So they are common prey for both killer whales and uh, leopard seals down there. But 
really that's kind of it. I mean, they are potentially at risk of things like, you know, plastic contamination and things like that. We have found plastics down in Antarctica, which is a little depressing. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, those are really their two biggest threats is environmental and predation. So it's and a fairly good situation for them down there. Yeah. And I even saw when I was like, I tried, you know, I tried to stay away from this, those because I'm like, I'm about to, I'm going to learn about that with cat. <laughs> but <laughs> the few times that I did look at it, some of them were like, they don't even really know that killer whales and leopard, like, like they think that they do, but it's not like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, this is definitely a, a major predator thing. It's like, eh, but they probably do because of what they, uh, those animals eat in other places. So I wonder how much what you know what the, so they likely probably do i'm sure killer whales have taken one or leopard seals have taken one um but what level of predation is that you know is that a, a significant one or is it just like off, off here and there when they happen to find one you know yeah and again like because they are solitary and they're pretty elusive it might be fairly low where like yeah. again it's the likelihood of you encountering one in the wild is already fairly low if you're a predator or if you're a human yep so yeah i, I mean i'm sure that there are other yeah exactly there are other easier prey items mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> so yeah <laughs> it's like a, it's like the um you know it's like oh i'm in the wild oh i'm gonna take that because i don't get, don't get to have that very often um right it's a delicacy exactly that's what i was looking for <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean it's good it's, it's great that they are um one of the few ones that we don't have to talk about all the depressing things that <laughs> are threatening them yeah which is fantastic. And again, a lot of that, unfortunately, slash fortunately for them, is because there is such a lack of human presence down there. Right. Um, you know, we don't have a large fishery, for the most part, down in Antarctica. You know, there are a lot of things that they may be at risk of in other locations that here they are simply just not exposed to. So pretty cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and just jump right into the new research of that. Yeah. About. Distribution and habitat suitability of Ross seals in a warming ocean. That's by uh, Weg et al. It's W-E-G-E -E, uh, in 2021. And this is the largest tracking study to date. Um, the first and the first habitat models for these and looking at also at the impacts of climate change. So they looked at they did new satellite tagging data. They had 11 animals from 2016 to 2019. And then they combined that with the previously published ones that had been done before. And those were eight of those in 2001. And they looked in the Waddell Sea, the King Hakon the Seventh Sea, and Lazarus. Ooh. I know. I was like, I didn't cool, know the King Hakon the Seventh Sea. That's <laughs> pretty cool. Uh, right, so then. they had um, 16, uh, they looked at 16 remote uh, sensing environmental variables to put into their model. Um, and they found that they preferred to forage in waters that were negative one to two degrees Celsius, where the mixed layer depth was shallower in summer and deeper in winter, um, and where current speeds were slower. So we already mentioned that they were probably not around the pack ice because of the, the currents. Um, and then away from the ice edge in the open ocean, which everybody already knew. Um, the receding ice edge and the shoaling of the mixed layer, um, I think the densities of the water and stuff um, created by climate change may reduce the swimming distances and diving depths, therefore reducing forage costs. So wow. because so they wouldn't have to go as far, right? Because the, the pack ice yeah. is reducing, then they could feed closer to where the, the land fast ice is and whatnot. Um, huh. And then how deep you would have to dive. So maybe they don't have to dive as deep because of where the, the that layer is shifting vertically in the water column. Mm. Um, so that's actually kind of good news. Um, but then there's the predicted increase in current speeds and say, uh, uh, sea surface temperatures may uh, reduce habitat suitability in these regions. <laughs> so oh. good news, bad news. So what they basically said was that in response to climate change may be regionally specific depending on the prey, how their prey responds to the climate change, and then their own, the seal's behavioral plasticity. So their, be, their ability mm. to change their behavior uh, accordingly. Interesting. So kind of a mix. Huh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think, that's, I, I think that's a case in a lot of the climate change stuff that we don't give enough um, you know, credence to or, or listening or looking at is that climate change 
isn't going to be all bad for every animal, right? For some, it's going to be great. For others, it's going to be terrible. And for some, it's going to be in the middle. Like, it's going to depend mm -hmm. a lot on the region, the individuals, the animals, and their behavioral plasticity, being able yep. to um, so I'm going to keep going on some feeding since we were just talking about feeding stuff. This is a uh, trophic position in foraging ecology by Brault et al. in 2019. Um, previously, they it was thought that the Ross seal was trophically in between the Weddell and the crab eater seal. So crab eaters are plankton, uh, plankton, which we've already talked about. Both of these guys, actually, we did crab eaters and Weddell, I believe, already mm -hmm. on the podcast. Yep. So go back and listen to those. Um, so they previously thought that the Ross seal was stuck in the middle of those, um, but they looked at compound specific isotope analysis of amino acids. And this was specifically to take into account uh, the shifting baseline versus the trophic structure. So we have to remember that the baseline for what we think the ecosystem is at is different than it was 30 years ago or 50 years ago or whatever. Um, so what we think of as normal now was not normal 30 years ago, um, but it shifts our, our perspective because we think this is what normal is. Um, so mm -hmm. this was this analysis was taking that into consideration. Um, and so they saw about, found that the Ross seal uh, eats in the open ocean, which we already know, um, and the Waddell and crab eaters eat closer to shore, but within similar food webs. So they it's kind of like doll's porpoises and harbor porpoises here, where they mm -hmm. really have a lot of the same food, but they eat in different places, right? Dolls Interesting. are in deeper water, yeah, and harbor porpoises shallower. So um, the crab eaters, they, they think, are likely following the sea ice, while the Waddells target productive areas on the continental shelf, and then the Ross seals go out in more open ocean. Um, and so what they found is that the Ross seals have a high trophic position that is equivalent to the Waddell seal, instead of being underneath it. Huh. Um, and this was contrary to prior ideas that came from nitrogen isotope studies. So looking at a different isotope and looking at it from a different perspective, um, puts the Ross seal uh, higher up in the trophic chain. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and so the crab eaters are, are lower trophically be than the Waddell and the Ross because they eat krill. So that makes sense. They're eating things lower on the food chain. Um, and I like the ending uh, to the abstract. I think this is from, um, quote, our results redefine the view of the trophic dynamics and foraging ecology of the Ross seal and also highlight the importance of quantifying baseline isotope variations in foraging studies. Mm -hmm. so making sure well that you're said. yeah exactly you're taking into consideration how things are shifting and how that affects the dynamics in foraging ecology of the, of the species so pretty yeah. cool that they're um redefining kind of where they where they sit in the trophic um the trophic chain yeah absolutely um the next one um is uh vester at all in 2020 i like the name of this one too i I usually don't put like the, the full title of most of these, but these were really good. Um, Ross seal distribution in the Waddell Sea, fact and fallacy. Ooh, yeah. nice. Yeah, it's very much like, we want to read more, which one's fact, which one's fallacy? I don't know. Um, so this is, again, a lot of this, this new work is, is like what we know previously is not actually what's happening, right? Um, so this one is they looked at uh, the fact that there was, con they basically said there was continuous distribution in the Waddell Sea from studies in 20 2002 and 2018, but those studies are at odds with results from previous work from 1969 to 1990. So hmm. which one's right, right? Which one's fact, which one's fallacy? So they looked, hmm. uh, they reviewed literature and the presence and absences during two expeditions in the summer and autumn of 2014 and 2018. And they went into the southernmost reaches of the Waddell Sea. And what they found was that it was absent from the sea during the winter, and they used the northernmost fringes of the pack ice during the spring breeding season. They were absent from the inner reaches of the Waddell Sea past 73 degrees south in the summer and early autumn when they occur in number, unknown why, in the eastern Waddell Sea, eastwards from about 30 west longitude. Um, and so like these inner reaches of the sea are devoid of Ross seals during the breeding season. So mm -hmm. the overall idea here is that they thought they were all over the world LC and they are not. Like there's specific. Interesting. Yeah. Places and times. Um, and some of them make sense because it's breeding season or whatever, but then these other aggregations or not aggregations, but locations where they are uh, hotspots. Um, yeah. Unsure at the moment why that occurs. Um, but 
very interesting. And again, and this is kind of like how we how we talk about with our porpoises and seals here, where like it might sound kind of like, okay, well, why do we care about that? Like mm -hmm. it's really important to know how a species is utilizing their environment, right? So if there are these hotspot areas and they're consistently being used by those animals, that might be of greater conservation status, right? To to preserve and and protect and and study that area. Um, and also just to know where the animals are hanging out for researchers, I would imagine would be incredibly helpful down there. Well, and then modeling the climate change, right? You, if you're modeling yeah. that certain areas are going to be more harder hit by climate change, well, that's important to know if that's where the, the seals are or not. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Yeah. So really interesting. So really kind of figuring, better figuring out where these guys are um, in the in the Wood LC and the other places in Antarctica. Uh, this next one, I'm going to do, the, I'm going to leave the, this other one for last. Um, this one is Loza et al. 2017. This is the sensory anatomy of the most aquatic seal. Apparently they are like live in the water the most out of all of them. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. And so this is, this is really, this is really interesting. Quote, a glimpse of a raw seal on the, on an ice floe in the Antarctic summer with its short flippers and thick neck is vaguely whale-like, hinting at the eight months of the year it spends exclusively at sea. Hmm. and so what's cool it's really they, cool yeah so what but even gets even cooler when when you get into the study because they said uh, they use non-invasive computed tomography on museum specimens so bones and stuff that they had of the ross and the leopard the waddell and the crab eater seals and then so relative to other phocids there's a reduction in the diameters of the semicircular canals so that's in your ears Mm -hmm. uh and then the paraflocular volume i don't know what the heck that is i didn't have time to look at into the paper but has to do around the in, in the ear area and head um and that's independent of size effects so relative no matter what basically they have smaller semicircular canals and this well, this paraflocular flocular volume um and so now we're going to go back to the whale like thing so these parallel the changes that, that you see in cetaceans in those structures cool yeah, so they're like kind of like whale-like, but they do not extend to other features such as the reduction in eye muscles and length of neck in cetaceans, right? So, mm. um, and they certainly, you know, probably have more eye muscles since they have giant eyes. <laughs> uh, right. So what what they're saying is this emphasizes the independence of some traits in convergent evolution. So there are some things that are like, everybody should have this if they're more aquatic, but these other parts don't have to be linked to that, depending on what they do. Also thinking about that short fur now, where mm -hmm. it's like, that's a lot less resistant to swimming. Yeah. It looks kind of less like, friction. It looks more rubbery, like a cetacean. Oh, that's so I, cool. They're like the link between. I wasn't going to say it. I wasn't going to say it, but now you said it. So said yeah, it. that's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> You're the missing link between cetaceans and pinnipeds. <laughs> Not really. Don't quote us on that. No, but, no, no. but um, it's, that's not it's, scientifically factual. However, no, not at all. Cool to cool to think about, though. Just right, saying. but it, yeah, it shows how things can converge. And I mean, it's like bats having wings and and birds having wings, but some swim, some fly, and they they're both doing it for a certain purpose, but they look very different, right? Yeah, that's um, a good analogy. Yeah, yeah. So they have these how things. Cool. Like certain, yeah, certain traits are really good for this specific thing if you're more aquatic, but depending on, on what else you do, the other parts don't have to come up with it. So very interesting. That's awesome. Yeah. So we're going to uh, leave um, one, one more. And we're going to, I'd like to save this one for last because it was, uh, again, WEG et al., W-E-G-E, uh, 2023, the nightlife of a Ross seal. Oh my gosh, I'm hooked. <laughs> right? What is it? What do they do? Oh, these titles are amazing. They're so good. Um. I was I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, so they had they did bio loggers that recorded the dive behavior. Um, they had five of those and or hollow behavior. They had nine of those in east in the eastern Wood LC from 2016 to 2019. So the dive profile, as I was mentioning before, uh, you know they you know a hundred few hundred meters deep. So it was one mostly were 100 to 200 meters deep, but often more than 300 meters. So they're going almost 900 feet, almost a thousand feet below. So you need those big eyes to wow. be able to see down there um they can go for five to 12 minutes and often over 20 minutes for their dive um in march through the july they um that's when they were mainly doing pelagic foraging so out in that open ocean 
Uh, the metrics varied diurnally, so they had like a day-night difference. Um, they were deeper, the dives were deeper during twilight and shallowest at night, which I think would make sense that they don't want to be down too deep where they can't see anything where predators might be. Um, well, and I'm also wondering if that has to do with the prey moving up mm -hmm. oh, that's true. at night yep. too, which mm -hmm. often happens, right? The, that kind of diurnal switch yep. with the prey moving up to the surface layers or the upper yep. layers of the water at nighttime. Um, so yeah, that would be, sorry, I just got distracted by a bird eating one of my raspberries. <laughs> sorry, I have a garden outside and there's a robin eating my raspberry. Um, yeah, so that makes total sense, right? They're following their prey. Um, and then, uh, and then going deeper during twilight went also, um, and then they follow it back up at night. Mm -hmm. Um, the number of dives and the duration did not have a pattern for day night. So okay. they, they did whatever. Um, and the diving effort was highest at night. So they do seem to be, and again, that would make sense if they're doing the deep scattering layer and it's coming up. Um, they can forage yeah. more efficiently and having not having to dive as deep. Um, at, at and especially if they are foraging more on like cephalopods, those are often more active at nighttime as well. So that would make a lot of sense. Yep, exactly. It all makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so then they um, preferentially hauled out in the middle of the day during September, October, February, and December, but not the rest of the year. And I find it really strange that is the order that they gave in the in the paper September October February and December I don't I don't understand why they didn't do it in order probably because that was the proportion so they probably hauled out oh. more in September October and then slightly less than that in February and January and, and December, December would be my guess interesting but December's when they're well maybe December's when they're mating so then they go back in February because they're I don't know anyway. <laughs> Good questions. So, seals are doing what they're doing. Um, but that probably makes sense that it's the, the level of, of how how much they are for each of those months. Um, but it basically, so that kind of September, like the that's what spring and spring. summer there. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, so that makes sense that they'd go up in the middle of the day. Um, then interestingly, the female, there were three females that they had during breeding season, and they hauled out continuously for five to seven days. So they're on land for five to seven days with water entries going back into the water one to three hours during and or after the continuous haul outs. So they'll stay on land mm. for quite a few days and then go out for about and then come back. Um, and this was interesting because it may suggest that the Ross seals are this intermediate between the capital and the facultative income breeding. So the ones that mm. basically just haul out the whole time and just don't eat for however long, weeks to a month. Um, versus those that stay on land for a few days then go or, or, or even a few hours then go out and eat and then come back and go back and eat and go back and forth mm -hmm. so these are kind of like in the middle they do a big chunk but then they still go out and feed they don't fast the entire time that they're interesting um, okay so they're, they're kind of like the the bridges for a lot of things yeah it's really so, interesting kind of in the middle um so that's uh, that's all I have for uh, the nightlife of the Ross seal, who is the also the most aquatic seal, and um, and yeah, they're very interesting guys. And and so it was interesting again that I really thought there wasn't going to be much new research on these guys because it's been so yeah. sparse. But I actually had to stop. I'm like, all right, I I can't talk more than about five articles. <laughs> There's a few other things. <laughs> right, we gotta pick and choose, but. That's exactly. really, no, I mean, and that's, that's all, honestly like incredibly cool. And I think a really big testament to our technology and our ability to get down there now and actually like carry out some of these studies safely, mm -hmm. um, you know, just with the technology that we have at our disposal now to be able to take research teams down to Antarctica, which, I mean, if you think about even in the 1990s, which is not that feasible. Right. Um, so it's, I mean, hopefully we'll continue to see more new research mm -hmm. on those guys. Yeah, I mean, it's great to see that there's interest in it and people are doing it, right? Because that's the other thing. We have the technology now, but are people, do people care enough to actually go out and try to do it? So, yeah, because they represent fun. My only fun fact, because we kind of covered all oh, yeah. the other fun facts in yeah. the episode already, but um, they are, they represent 1% of the Antarctic seal population. So they are literally like the, the, the only 1% of the Antarctic seal population is represented by Ross seals. So it's, there's not very many of them. So it's really cool to see that people are taking an interest and are actually finding enough seals to be able to study them, you know? Right. It really is a needle in the haystack, whether you're looking on land or in the water for these guys. Yeah. It's amazing yeah, that they absolutely. were able to tag any of them. Or that the yeah. animals didn't just freak out when they 
you know, capture them, tag them. So, you know, like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure they weren't super happy, but oh, I mean, yeah, you know, I did see, I did see the reason I say that is I saw a picture online of, of a, a couple of researchers trying to kind of corral a raw seal in order to tag it. And it did not look thrilled, but <laughs> <was> like, <laughs> very uncool guys. Like, Right. Yeah, I'm not what is going you on here? because I don't know who you are or what you are because you're never here. But also, this is not great. I don't love it. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, again, apologies for our faux pas. But hopefully, yes. you guys enjoyed hearing about the raw seal instead. Mm -hmm. And again, if you want to go listen back to our ring seal episode, please do so. We covered that one already for you. So yeah. it's kind of like a two for one deal, honestly. This this week, so yeah, you know, and you can go back and and listen to the crab eater and the um what else seal because we also covered those so like yeah do an antarctic seal binge of all of those go. episodes and just like yeah that's a great idea love it um i so i the one percent just is still boggling to me i mean now it really makes Isn't that wild it's just crazy um mm -hmm. anyway they're a super cool our little pug friend um pug or persian depending on if you like cats or dogs uh version of the seal the raw seal um, so we will have um, all the links to our sources in the show notes, as well as the papers that we talked about. And again, if you're on YouTube, you've been able to see the beautiful pictures of these crazy guys. Um, but uh, if not, please look them up because they are very interesting. Um, we, again, um, will make sure to check out our website and Facebook and Instagram and our merch store. We will be hopefully having some new stuff soon as we're getting closer to our one year, uh, 10 year anniversary in October um and so keep an eye on on our socials and stuff for that for updates to logo to our hopefully our logo and have some more designs as we're excited to celebrate that um we also will be starting uh very soon on facebook uh, a fundraiser for our new engine for the boat that we got and uh, we're hoping to we're actually it's getting worked on right now so we're raising funds to be able to cover the costs of being of putting a new engine on a boat which is if you have a boat you know it's not cheap uh <laughs> So your support for that would be amazing to be able to get us back up on the water and being able to get out and get more information on the harbor seals and harbor porpoises that we studied here. Um, and keep an eye out for our, um, just our stuff. In our pictures we'll say i will say one last thing we are going to have a little bit of a longer yes. break between our next this one and our next episode cindy's going to be away for a couple weeks um so we will be back in probably about three weeks versus two yeah. weeks um yeah. so you know again plenty of time for you to go back and listen to some antarctic seal information exactly um i'll be out we'll just pretend uh, that this was all totally right. in on plan right exactly <laughs> Everything was planned. Um, yes, and I will be out um, in the Bahamas with my old, um, where I used to work in the uh, with spotted dolphins. So I'll hopefully have some fun stories to share with everybody when I get back, uh, as long as no hurricanes come and do anything weird over there during hurricane season. <laughs> Weather stay calm. Um, so with that, then we will be back in about three-ish weeks instead of two weeks, and we'll likely be a um, a journal review, uh, or if you want us to talk about something, please let us know. Um, again, reach out on social media and uh, and or email us. We'd love to hear from you about what you would like to, um, to have us talk about. Um, and you can always support us on our um, the podcast um, to uh, be a paid subscriber. Uh, and any other donations go straight back into our research and helping us be able to do this work. So with that and my dog barking in the background, we will talk to you next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks. <laughs>